So my talk here is going to be how to undermine AI dystopia. All right, so the first thing I want to talk to you about is psychopaths. Um, for you, those of you who have read my abstract, you knew I was going to talk a little bit about science fiction. So Psychopaths is an anime series I like a lot that talks about a dystopic near future in a country where everybody has a personal score that is given based on the way you think about things, you feel about things, and how you make decisions. So this number is called the crime coefficient, and it varies from 0 to 500. And you're all the time going through constant scanning and permanent surveillance. Each number of those is correlated in a range to a hue. And the darker hues, they have to go to therapy to clear their hues and get lighter. Or they become second class citizens because this crime coefficient defines the type of career and prospects you can have in life. So this is so accurate and taken so seriously in this country that people can do real-time judgments, and the police uses a dominator, which is this weapon here. And just based on the credit you have, on the score you have, the, this weapon can, be, can become locked if you're considered safe. It can become a stunner, or it can kill you on the spot. And this is all in conformity to civil system standards, which is a collective artificial intelligence that runs and evaluates everyone. So, so let's talk about real life. The, do we have anything similar to that in real life in a smaller um, proportion? So yeah, we could talk about Zima credit, which is also known as Sesame credit. It is a very popular um, Chinese company. And what they do is they also attribute um, three-digit scores to everyone and the government in China wants to do wants to get everyone enrolled up to 2020 so everyone will have a page in this system and the social credit score is it's a an Alibaba data partner and you can score from 350 to 950 it's based on five factors which you can see here in this radar um, Sorry for the quality of images. This was the best one I could find. So the five factors would be credit history, which is like, um, are you in debt? Are you a good payer? Behavior and preferences, which is like, where do you spend your time and where do you go? And the one of executives for Sesame Credit explained that if you spend 10 hours a day playing video games, you should score less than someone who has a buying habit of diapers because they're probably parents, so they're probably more responsible than you. So, um, so fulfillment capacity, which is like, how much do you make and what can you afford with that? Identity characteristics, which is demographics, basically, who are you, gender, where you live, and social relationships, basically, who you're friends with. Are they good credit people or are they bad credit people? So. It is also monthly updated. You can see it also uses hues. It goes from red until very, very blue, bright blue. And it affects, all, of course, the borrowing and renting capacity. Sometimes you have to make a beforehand deposit to ensure you can even rent a bike, for example, which is something very common in China. You, they control your social network exposure. So for example, if you go on a Chinese Tinder app, you are going to have more visibility if you have a higher score. So you have a higher chance to score. And then the traveling permits. <laughs> so it's like where you can go and if you can get vis visas. Um, the Chinese government actually, it has refuted over 11 million travel permits inside China and outside China from locals because of the credits they already have and purchase attempts. In the future, they want to make it so that if you're um, in debt and you're trying to contract new debt, you're trying to make new purchases, they can refute to force you to pay whatever you already owe, even if it's basic purchases like food, for example. And low scores can enter downward score spirals because, for example, if I have a friend and they have a low score, I might drop them as a friend in my social networks because I don't want to contaminate my own score. So. <laughs> it's just incentives, basic incentives. So people that are that 
get there, they can get trapped there and start spiraling down. But there is one good thing that this system has brought is that tens of millions of Chinese now have access to financial services. China is something amazing because in 2011, um, almost every transaction in the country was made with cash. They had very few credit cards, and if you wanted to change banks, you had to go through a very thorough assessment of your credit. And now because of the system, they are able to let you do a lot of things and actually give you fast tracks in life if you have good social credit. The bad thing is that the precise inputs of the model are unknown. We have the factors, but we don't know exactly how they play out. We don't know the model, it's proprietary. So now we're entering in an era that we have to be aware of their meanings. Um, meanings of things such as good and evil, which is something very popular. Google itself, as a Google expert, I think I have the right to say, likes to put that out a lot. And we sometimes don't know what that means, actually. And one good example for transparency, I'll talk a little bit later, but we also have to be aware now of what transparency and privacy and content means in this new era of machine learning and AI. For example, transparency. We have a system which is a criminal risk assessment when you are detained by the police in the United States, you have to answer 137 questions wherever this um, system is accepted. And it measures the likelihood of you to reoffend in crime. And then it changes how much time you would spend in jail based on that. And the company that produces it, Equivent, used it, um, explained that it was very transparent and used it as a sell point because the parameters were known, they said, since you were filling in the document yourself. And because of that, it was used as input for court sentences in the US. However, the truth is, even though you've answered 137 questions, you don't know how those things got factored in and the different weights they have and the different parameters that really matter to the model. This was undisclosed as well because it was also proprietary. So in a very high profile case of Loomis versus Wisconsin, this guy, he was, um, he committed a crime, he was guilty of committing a crime and he was gonna be arrested for two years. But the system said that he should be arrested for six years because he was likely to reoffend. And just like him, there were several others. And he tried to argue that he had no right to due process. He couldn't defend himself because he didn't know why he was considered a high-risk offender. But the judge kept a uh, steady um, decision, and he was in jail since 2013. He'll probably leave jail next year. So there, there are very complex racial biases investigations by ProPublic, which is a Pulitzer-winning association. And it's not for sure that this happens, but the system uses as input models some variables that are correlated to crime, but they're also very highly co correlated to um, people of color lifestyles or demographics. And this spurred algorithmic reg regulation in New York. It wasn't signed by the mayor after all, but they're changing the bills to take that into consideration, try to prohibit systems like that, black box systems to um, function. But I'm talking about very like complicated things here. I'm talking about China, I'm talking about criminal people. I guess nobody here got arrested or is, planned, is planning on getting arrested. So we can talk about something simpler, which is like GPS. For example, we have here in Brazil, some companies that as a privacy cell point, they use your GPS data and they say that they're not collecting PII and since they are very respectful of your privacy. PII, which is personally identifiable information, um, is something like your name, your um, address, credit card statements, um, social secu security numbers, CPF, things like that. And GPS data is not regarded as PII, but actually it is possible to determine home and work address, the routes you take, and your geo behavior as a whole. Um, even if you don't tell them that. So would you consider that a PII or not? Because effectively, if you know where the person lives, 
where, where he or she works and the route she takes, you can pretty accurately reverse it back to her and identify who she or he is. And even something very silly can review private data, which um, like the number of apps you have on your phone or which apps you have. This is a model by a company in Brazil where they have the, they don't know who you are, but they know which apps you have and the number of apps you have on your phone. And the model is made to, to try and predict gender. If you have more than 100 apps on your cell phone, there's an 87% chance you're a man. If you have quotes for rainy days, or quotes for crying, or quotes for my boyfriend, you have a 75% chance of being a woman. However, if you have quotes for rainy days, and quotes for crying, and quotes for my boyfriend, you have a 91% chance of being a man. And imagine what you can do with that information. It's information that here maybe it doesn't make, um, we, we, we don't make a lot of difference with that, but in some countries that could be very complicated. That could be used to target you some way. So the moral here, this is from a book I like a lot, data mining. And the moral here is that if you really do remove all possible identification information from a database, you will probably be left with nothing useful. So everything pretty much you do. Um, there was this very popular Netflix case in which people could understand who was rating the movies just based on when they did it and which movies they rated. And they could track it back and know who the person was just because of that. So um, I'm talking here, uh, I gave you four kind of bad examples, yeah? And I'm here to talk about how to undermine AI dystopia. So is there a light in the end of the tunnel? And yes, there is. Fortunately, so those four types of institutions, they are now, after doing a lot of stuff, they are now getting very concerned about ethical and moral quandaries and challenges in their development of AI, machine learning models, deep learning models. So we have good examples from academia, government, practitioners, and private companies, which I'll give in a little while. And the good thing is, even though they're, prob they're most likely working by themselves, they're kind of working by themselves, we all want pretty much the same. So I'll show you some of the principles they have. And I try to divide them into those four, five groups, which is intelligibility, is understanding where the data come from and where the result came from. Data awareness, which is like, which type of data are you using? Are you reinforcing a bias? Are you trying to correct it? Accountability, human rights, and security. So I'll give you first the example I like best because I think it's very precise. I won't read all the text. You can read it later if you want to. So the, the one I like best is one, the one from AI, AI, Now, AI Now Institute's principles because they said, for example, the first one, is core public agencies, such as those responsible for criminal justice, healthcare, welfare, and education, are high stake domains, and they should no longer use black box AI and algorithmic systems. And we can understand that because they're talking about public um, institutions and they have to serve everyone equally. So this is very to the point, but I, I won't comment anymore. But just for, for you to check, the, there, we have the orange color tag, which is intelligibility. We have the data awareness tags here and here, which is be, be sure that you're not introducing bias or enforcing bias in your data, in your models. And after, and this is accountability. Who's responsible for that? This happens to in IEEE principles. They take into consideration human rights, accountability, and intelligibility. UK House of Lords principles that they launched this year. And they take a lot in consideration human rights and intelligibility. Intelli intelligibility, um, data awareness and security here. And finally, Google's own principles, which I think are, they have to be improved, um, which also take into consideration human rights, data awareness, security, and intelligibility. So we got more or less, we want more or less the same things, even though we're doing that separately, we kind of agree to where we're headed. So this is good. But like, what can you do? Because I'm talking about what AI now does and what Google does and whatever, but you can also get involved 
and this type of things that will change and shape the future of how we do machine learning and artificial intelligence. So I am part of the Association for Computing Machinery Special Interest Group on AI, and I'm also part of two of those working groups, this one and this one, which, are all, which all come from my IEEE 7000 principle um, working group, and they were the ones that made the principles for AI that I just cho showed you. So now they're open, you can enroll, you can just search that there, and you get on the page. They have, we have monthly meetings, and when you're assiduous, you can get voting rights. This is very important because associations such as ACM or IEEE, they are adopted everywhere in the world. So if you're part of that, you can make sure that you are having a say on the future of how we're going to get related to AI and machine machine learning, all those other types of intelligent systems. So what we want to do is control. So how can I control a superintelligence? And we could spend like so much time talking about that. But essentially, there are ways to do this. We can use boxing, which is putting it in a restrained environment. We can use incentives, such as fitness functions or reward functions. We can use supervision. And when we establish which are the aims they have to reach, we can use stunting when we um, propositely decrease their performance. And we can use tripwires, which is when they work in a way we did not predict or that is not according to what we were expecting, we can um, turn, them, turn them off. We can shut them down. This happened in the 2010 um, shares crisis in the United States, where AIs were trading so quickly that in six minutes it, they made trillions of dollars disappear. And it would be much worse, it would have been much worse if strip wires weren't in place in that case. So, um, when we think about that, we have to consider that this is one of the things that Alan Turing said in his paper that defined the Turing machine. That instead of trying to produce a program to simulate the adult mind, why not we rather try to produce one which simulates a child? If this were then subjected to an appropriate course of education, one would obtain the adult brain. And that is what we're doing, and that is why we have to be careful. I don't think we consciously think about that when we're developing, that we're training a child's brain, but that is essentially what AI is in the end of the things, in the end of the day. So, for example, if we don't take that into consideration, we have pretty bad examples of things that can happen. For example, this is Tay, Tay AI, which was put forth by Microsoft in 2016 on Twitter. And it was supposed to simulate a chatbot that was supposed to simulate uh, an adolescent girl. And what happened was pretty bad, because we can't have nice things on the internet. So, pretty much what happened was that in 24 hours, Microsoft had to apologize and take it down because it was completely racist and xenophobic and used very inappropriate language. Um, the same thing happened in 2017 with DeepMind, um, which is one of the companies from Alphabet. And they put forth this game where two different AIs, the blue and the red one, had to collect apples, the green ones. And they gave um, two pieces of information. They said that the AI had to collect the most number of apples it could, and that it could launch a laser, this yellow being here, against the other AI to paralyze and retard it a little bit. So they found that whenever the apples were plentiful, it was okay. They cooperated, it, they had no problem. But then they started making the apples scarce, and the AI started shooting one another. So then it was another great chaos that Google's AI got highly aggressive and lures that betray on aggressive actions pay off and Google pitted AI against AI and where are we going? But it's like, this is our fault. We told it that it had to get the most apples it could and the only weapon we gave it was a laser. <coughs> it couldn't tell jokes to make everything better. It couldn't compete in any other way. We gave it the option to do it and be aggressive or not do it at all, yeah? So good things also can happen if we give AI the right environment. And this week, IBM put forth the Project Debater. I don't know if you've seen it. But it's an AI that read, that read 
hundreds of millions of articles, and it's now debating some of the um, most star debaters in the world. And we have a really good repercussion on that because it's really inspiring to see that happening. But I find it interesting that these are not tabloids. These are all very high-profile tech magazines and online pages. We, all, we always make like a point of saying this. The AI pro this AI program could be true in an argument, but it doesn't know what it's saying. I think it's funny because we always make a point of making it clear that it doesn't know what it's saying when it's something positive. But when it's something negative, we never say that. We never remind ourselves that it doesn't know what it's saying. And doing that makes us very omissive because it's like, this is not, this is not our fault. This is the fault of Twitter, or this is the fault of someone else, or this is the fault of, of the own AI. When we didn't make uh, an appropriate environment to set it in. So another quote, and this is a big one. So we should resist the temptation to roll every normatively desirable attribute into one giant amorphous concept of mental functioning, as though one could never find one admirable trait without all the others being equally present. And the opposite also happens. We are in a point where everything that we do is very polarized. It's either awesome and 100% good or awful and 100% bad. And this is not how life works. Thinking about it that way is a bit selfish and a bit childish. So we have to recognize that there can exist instrumentally powerful information processing systems or intelligence systems that are neither inherently good nor reliably wise. But we can make it happen. We can make it kind of good and kind of wise at least, if we try. So I don't know if you've seen that movie. I don't think it's a especially good movie. It's on Netflix, Chappie. And, but I think it has some interesting insights because this guy created a generic, complete um, artificial intelligence and put it in a robot. And it could learn everything and do everything just like a normal person. It was a perfect cognitive system. And, well, it learns a bunch of different things that what he was expecting. And it kind of turns into a gangster and everything. But we, you, you kind of understand in a very um, romanticized way what can happen if you don't treat AI like something you're making learn. Yeah? So the final remark here of this talk is to undermine AI dystopia, what we should do is to treat AI like your very own child. Yeah? I am not a mother, but I have a mother and a father. And I think I kind of know how they work. It's pretty much like this. So the first thing is like, don't let it run loose. When you have a, a kid, you don't let it go and do whatever it pleases. You're kind of like always around. You're kind of checking up on them and seeing what they're doing. You have to know who they're talking to, like checking who their friends are. So it's like, well, my kid is talking on Twitter with some really random people, which are very racist and xenophobic. I don't think I want my kid there. You should provide high quality reading material. You should establish rules and learn to say no. And this is very, this is metaphorical, but it's also very mm, real because we, we are the ones that establish rules in a variety of supervised systems, which are very, very common in enterprises and everything. And sometimes there are things that we thought, we think it's cool to make, and we think it's cool if we could get it done, but there are potential risks um, attached to it, and we have to learn to say no, we have to learn to let it go at some point. We have to attend parents' meetings, which are always very a bummer, like, but parents' meetings in that way would be like those working groups you can take part in and try to help standardize and shape the future of AI, discuss those types of things, because we tend to always discuss models and new technologies and new libraries and new packages, and we forget to discuss those other things of what we can do and what we should do to train AIs and educate AIs, especially if we're aiming for something more generic. And finally, we imagine ways it could get hurt or hurt others. Like if you have a kid, I had a sister and a younger brother as well. And my parents were always very afraid when they sent them to school because they would always think like, oh my gosh, is he gonna get bitten or is he gonna be the biter? 
And you always teach your kid to like share your toys and don't beat anyone up unless anyone beats you up. And that's pretty much what we should do with our AIs. And finally, we can see it grow and thrive and be proud of it and the work we've done. Okay, so that's it. Thank you all. Any questions?